So I want to talk a little bit today about uh, ROP. It's kind of two of my interests right now are pediatrics and, and retina. So it's kind of a nice bridging topic for me to discuss. Um, so kind of a generic case to start off with. Baby boy is born at 27 weeks gestation, weighing 980 grams uh, on oxygen in the NICU. When and how often do you screen these ba a baby such as this for ROP? If they do have ROP, when do you treat? And then the question also is, how do you treat? So just briefly on some of the screening guidelines. Uh, these are, people have different, uh, there's different guidelines out there. Some are more stringent, some are a little bit more loose, but uh, kind of the currently accepted uh, APOS guidelines is any baby born before basically 31 weeks, uh, regardless of their birth weight, uh, if a baby is born 1,250 grams or less, or any baby that the neonatologist deems as high risk. And then when do you screen these babies? Uh, if they're, uh, it should be formed at 31 weeks post-menstrual age in infants that are born uh, basically before 27 weeks, uh, or if they're born before 27 weeks, then four weeks chronological age from that point on. And then there's also some criteria that suggest maybe screening at six weeks of life if they're born before 25 weeks. So once you see these babies and you say, okay, this baby looks like they have some evidence of ROP, um, when do we follow up? There's kind of four can't, four categories of follow-up time periods. So the first is one week follow-up, one week or less. These are babies that are high risk, babies that have uh, stage one or two ROP in zone one, uh, immature vasculature or aggressive uh, posterior ROP. Then the next category is the one to two week follow-up. These are kids that had zone one ROP but are unequivocally regressing, uh, stage two, zone two, and then also just immature vascular in the posterior zone two area. And then the two-week follow-up, these are kids, again, that are getting better and better, uh, unequivocally regressing ROP zone two, and some still immature vascularization. And then the third category is kids that are clearly getting better, that are into zone three, uh, but still have a little bit of evidence of ROP. So how do we screen these kids to know who has ROP, who's at risk for ROP? It's a really hot topic right now in, in the research and the literature. Uh, there's some... Uh, different research going on on uh, monitoring IGF-1 levels um, as an indicator for risk for ROP. Um, also monitoring VEGF levels and pigment epithelial derived factor. Uh, and also erythropoietin levels. Um, these have all shown some, some evidence, but uh, not a ton yet. It's, uh, it's still not quite clear how effective these are, how sensitive, how specific these are going to be at catching all the kids that we need to screen. So another reason this is a big topic is not every hospital has a, with a NICU has pediatric ophthalmologists or retina specialists uh, easily accessible to screen all these babies that may need screening. Uh, so that brings up the teleretinal imaging idea. This has been shown to be really good for clinically significant ROP, but kids that have mild ROP that are in the early stages, um, it's not that it hasn't shown been shown to be great yet. Um, people have looked at different maternal risk factors. Uh, preeclampsia, diabetes have been shown to be associated with ROP, but there's a confounding effect because a lot of these babies that come from preeclampsia or diabetic mothers are born premature. Uh, and then also another way to monitor these is look for kids who have high oxygen saturation goals. Uh, there's a, a, a decent association between how high that goal is and how risk, high risk they are for ROP. Kind of the underlying, underlying principle though is there's nothing really beats taking a look and getting imaging hand in hand. So once we decide that a kid has ROP, um, there's basically three criteria for when we say, yep, we need to go ahead and treat. Uh, so zone one ROP with any stage of plus disease, uh, zone one ROP stage three with no plus disease, or zone two stage two or three with plus disease. So then it leads to the question, how do we treat? Uh, and this is probably where there's the most research and most um, controversy or opinion on a different camps on what the best way to do this is. Um, so laser right now is the standard of care. Uh, some positives about laser, we know that it improves the functional and structural outcome versus kids who have no treatment. Um, we know it's effective at halting progression of ROP in most kids. Uh, but there's a lot of negatives associated with it as well. Uh, we know it decreases VEGF levels in the blood, although much less significantly than with anti-VEGF treatments. Um, there's destruction of tissue, uh, we've lost peripheral vision, high myopia, uh, we see these kids sometimes growing up to be minus 15, minus 20. Um, it doesn't work for everyone, and uh, it's a very high-stress procedure for these kids. A lot, of, a lot of stress and trauma to them. So then the other option we have is anti-VEGF treatment. So 
Uh, just some, some pictures here of some kids dem uh, demonstrating the difference between laser and ROP or uh, anti-VEGF treatment in some of these kids. So this top picture, this was uh, before laser treatment and this is after laser treatment. You can see where the ridge was and where the laser treatment was done. Vascularization, you know, stopped there, uh, halted the progression effectively. Uh, and this doesn't happen in every single patient, but in a lot of patients we're seeing kids treated with anti-VEGF. You can see where this ridge was and after anti-VEGF treatment, the vessels continue to progress all the way out to the far periphery. <coughs> so big questions with anti-VEGF, are they safe? Um, and if they are safe, what's the best anti-VEGF treatment? We have you know, multiple options. And then what dose? And what are the long-term side effects? A lot of questions that we're trying to get answers to. Some of the things we do know about anti-VEGF, uh, we know that it increases uh, anti-VEGF increases the vascularization. Uh, there's some evidence that shows that it decreases the myopia, although it's not 100% clear at this time. Uh, it is much less invasive uh, for the patient, much less stressful, and they develop better peripheral vision, assuming they can go ahead and progress to the periphery. Uh, some of the negatives, we know that it decreases the VEGF levels in the blood. Um, this is one of the biggest questions, is this safe? Uh, then you can also see kids that get this chronic arrest of the vascularization. Uh, kids sometimes reactivate after treatment. Uh, there's been mixed results of successful treatment for these kids. And then also there's been shown to be some abnormal vasculature. The significance of this is unknown at this time because these kids are still so young and uh, it's hard to tease out um, you know, how much of their, their abnormal vascular is from being premature versus uh, the treatments. So here's a picture from a recent study showing this chronic arrest of the vasculature after uh, bevacizumab injections. You can see you know, pre-injection and post-injection didn't really progress much. So one of the big questions I mentioned earlier was the uh, VEGF response systemically in these kids. So you can see uh, in this study by Kong et al. with laser, uh, the VEGF systemic, um, the VEGF level systemically did drop a little bit for uh, time period, uh, not as much as the intravitreal bevacizumab. But there was a, a, a drop there. And then uh, the levels of anti-VEGF seen in this, so in the serum for eight weeks, you see a decrease. In the injected eye, you see it for eight weeks. And even in the other eye, uh, the fellow eye, you see a decrease for a couple weeks of VEGF levels. Uh, a recent study that we're actually a part of here uh, was uh, looking to see what dose is going to be the most effective. Uh, so basically what they did in this study was took uh, 61 premature infants with type 1 ROP and uh, started treating them with different doses of bevacizumab. Every time a group was successful in their treatment, then the, co the dose was cut in half. Uh, so you can see 10 out of 14, received, 10 out of 14 infants received 0.25 milligrams, uh, and then it dropped down to 0.125 and 0.063, and finally it is 0.031 milligrams, uh, basically 1 20th of the, of the current uh, of the beat drop dose, which is one of the bigger studies uh, measuring how much and what medication to treat with. So this was showed to be quite successful. Uh, some of the uh, downsides of this study was it was a small study size, a short follow-up period at this point, although it's still being monitored, and we didn't monitor the VEGF levels. Yeah. That was the very last dose. <coughs> and we did actually measure. We did. Up. Okay, I misread that. No, no, please. No, it's okay. That was my mistake. Another study recently came out uh, called the, the CARE ROP uh, study, and they looked at using ranibizumab or Lucentis instead of uh, Avastin uh, and using even lower doses than we currently use. So they took two groups. Uh, one group had 0.12 milligrams and one group had 0.2 milligrams and found that in both groups the vascularization uh, went all the way to the oris serrata. Um, systemic VEGF was not uh, significantly suppressed. Um, there were a few eyes that needed retreatment in the 0.12 milligram group and in the 0.2 milligram group uh, one, one kid needed a, a second retreatment, so three injections total. Uh, it was interesting to note that the vascularization of the oris serrata was uh, better in the point. 1, 2 milligram group versus the 0.2 milligram group. And the reason this is significant is Bev or ranibizumab is a smaller molecule, has a shorter half-life. Uh, so theoretically, if it is getting into the system, uh, then potentially it's not having as much of a systemic effect. 
So some of the important points about this study, uh, the serum anti-VEGF levels were monitored for up to eight weeks, um, longer if there's more retreatments required. And, uh, you know, as I said, like mentioned previously, there was not a huge decrease in the systemic VEGF levels. Um, some of the kids did need to have rescue treatment, which basically means they didn't respond at all and they needed laser uh, within the first 28 days. And there was one kid, one child in the 0.2 milligram group that had respiratory failure that was thought to be likely to the anti-VEGF treatments. Um, and uh, not shown on this slide was the kids who had the 0.2 milligram dose needed to be on oxygen for a significantly longer amount of time than the kids who received the 0.12 um, milligram group. So even though the veg anti-VEGF levels were not measurably decreased, there seemed to be some effects, uh, which that's going to need some more research to figure out exactly what's going on there. So overall, in all these different studies of different uh, anti-VEGFs and different doses, there's a lot of mixed results. Uh, Aaron Bulu and colleagues found that uh, 4 out of 5 kids improved, 14 out of 16 eyes. Uh, Yi and colleagues found that in a larger study that there was good success. Um, Castellanos and colleagues found that six out of six kids treated with ranibizumab had complete resolution. Uh, but then there's other studies. One colleagues found that uh, six eyes treated with ranibizumab, five had reactivation of ROP in, in, uh, within an average time of six weeks. So in conclusion, some of the big things that we are uh, kind of taking away from all this research is that right now it's still unknown if anti-VEGF treatment uh, for ROP is effective, um, safe and effective. More research is needed. Uh, novel screening methods are continually evolving. Uh, nothing beats an indirect exam uh, with imaging. Uh, lower doses and short-acting agents may be better in terms of vascularization and lower morbidity. Uh, again, more research is needed there. Uh, right now, laser is the standard of care, but anti-VEGF is increasingly shown to have a role in treating these babies with ROP. And for now, there's no, uh, no FDA approval for anti-VEGF treatment for ROP. And finally, when it is decided to treat these babies with either laser or, or anti-VEGF, uh, it's very important to have a very detailed, informed consent process to explain the risks and benefits of both these treatments because there's no, there's no perfect answer for this very, very, you know, possibly devastating disease. Any questions, concerns? Yes, please. So my sense is, and I want to be corrected by my retinal colleagues, that even though there's still a lot of questions that, that the general wave of interest is moving where increasingly people are using VEGF inhibitors rather than lasers. That is not, are we at the point where more than half of these kids are getting treated with VEGF? I'm not sure about that, but yes, there's greater interest. So the BROT study was mainly in zone one, poster zone two, and the guidelines from the American Academy of Pediatrics and Ophthalmology are to treat zone one or eyes that are very bad, but, but there's been a wave of interest in treating all type one severe ROP, so that's zone two as well. Um, and, and the concerns, as, as Chris nicely pointed to, um, are there. So even in the <coughs> ROP1 study, which is one of the trials that we're enrolled in, at 120th, the B broad dose, serum veg up was reduced for over a month Ooh. in these babies. So the babies are developing. The, the other problem with all the studies that come out is that we tend to look at them and think that premature babies are We don't are even know what we don't genes. know over 20 years. Right, well some of them are from India, some of them are from, and the babies are older developmental age and they're larger. So when they get the same dose of anti-VEGF in a larger eye that goes into a larger blood volume, it's, it's uh, the concentration is much reduced compared to the premature babies that we have in the United States or in countries that really regulate uh, oxygen or have the resources to do that, and in which 22 and 23 week gestational age babies are surviving. So we really can't compare the two. They're apples and oranges. And those babies that are so developmentally immature there are lots of things going on besides their brain and their lungs that are developing where VEGF is important. The choroid, the photoreceptors, the circuits that develop within the cells within the retina are all developing and they may need VEGF signaling. And our lab has shown that when you inhibit, so we, we figured out what's the optimal dose of anti-VEGF. So we used a very representative model in a rat because we can't experiment on babies. 
And we knocked down, we figured out what cells overexpress EGF. So Mueller cells do a lot of that. We knocked down the EGF by using a cell-specific promoter and a short hairpin RNA to the EGF. And so it knocked down the EGF two levels that were the, in the retina that were the same as a room ear rat of the same developmental age. So we felt that was physiologic. And even when we did that, we had long-term thinning of the outer nuclear layer. So what does that mean long-term? I, I don't know. We had some neuroprotective factors that were also released. So maybe the retina is able to respond, but the rat is full term. So we really have a lot of questions we don't know. I think that the, what we're getting at now is that we need more than just anti-VEGF. We need protective mechanisms. We need to be able to introduce methods that will allow the babies to vascularize their avascular retina, have protection against that compromised vascularity within the already developed vessels that occur with high oxygen and then also allow the baby to develop and mature. And so, anyway, that's where our, our lab is working toward looking at that and uh, some of the receptors that might be useful in that way. Practically, though, as I, as I go around in different places, there's more and more I, I sense that this is what they're doing. If you want those questions unanswered, so I know they're, moving to, they're moving to VEGF injections rather than, than using laser. It's so much easier to do an injection. I you know, know laser is very, it's hard on the body, you know, on the, of the surgeon. It's kind of experimental progress, which is happening in, in, in developing countries, when anti-VEGF treatments became available, a lot of people moved, with some disastrous results, to doing injections entirely, not knowing that kids would come back with Fulman and ROP. So, it, in a lot of cases, it isn't a decision between anti-VEGF and laser. It's becoming a combination of both, where you know Dr. Hartman's colleagues are treating the posterior fulminant ROP with anti-VEGF, and then instead of worrying about that ticking time bomb of having ROP coming back, going ahead and doing laser. So in essence, the same eye is getting both through. Thanks, Chris. I think that was a really interesting talk. And kind of to Emmy's point, I just had a quick question. It's not well resolved in the literature at present what physiologic systemic VEGF levels are in these preterm infants. So even though most of the studies that are done compare treated babies to babies with ROP with an alternative treatment like laser, maybe those babies have higher systemic VEGF levels and that's one hypothesis that's out there. And one group out of Japan has shown, in fact, that that's true. They had a very small sample size, of course, because it's so difficult to look at these babies. But, um, and Emmy's point as well made that different populations have different uh, age ranges in which we're seeing ROP due to the technologies and ability to administer oxygen, et cetera. But they did show that the treatment with anti-VEGF, while it did access the systemic circulation, it uh, did not lower systemic VEGF below what we were seeing physiologically in babies of similar gestational age. But that's one like very small study, and I just don't think it's well resolved in the literature. Did you get a sense of that at all in your reading? No, I, I, I think that was a big point that Dr. Hartman and I talked about was uh, there's no clear resolution anywhere. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of big question marks, a lot of, you know, can't point in different directions and, you know, using their evidence to back up, you know, the feelings they have towards usually. But, um, yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. And, and I will say, look, our, I, I agree with you, Leah, definitely. I, in, in the ROP1 study, we also me measured bevacis in, that, in the serum, which that Japanese study may have done as well. And it was still elevated, so. The drug itself. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's published yet. So Interestingly, though, this is becoming standard care across the country. It absolutely is. Where I trained, it was standard care. 